OK, uh, so uh, today we're going to continue our exploration of caches. Uh, this lecture is titled Lecture 24A, a little bit aggressively. I'm not sure if we will actually go, be, go to, we'll have time to go to 24B, which is going to be virtual memory. But if we have time, we'll also uh, make a head start in virtual memory. If not, we will start virtual memory next week. Uh, but today's lecture will assume, uh, hopefully, we will learn a lot about uh, advancements in caches, uh, building up on what we started with yesterday. And these are the readings. Uh, remember, I added this reading on memory systems, which covers both caches and memory systems in general, as well as, uh, as, well as virtual memory and virtual to physical translation. And I would recommend that you do it. And remember, uh, yesterday, we start out with the memory hierarchy, built up the reasons for it. We want both fast and big, fast and large. And how do we get it? Basically, we added heterogeneity and hierarchy into our memory system so that we can get fast and large at the same time, hopefully, as much as possible. So we have fast caches closer to the processor, but they're small. And we have large caches far away from the processor, but they're slow. But hopefully, uh, by doing good management in the memory hierarchy, whenever the processor needs to access data, it finds it in the L1 cache, the fast caches, basically. So you get the illusion of a large capacity uh, memory while getting the speed of a small capacity or fast memory. And of course, you try to maintain that illusion as much as possible, but once you get cache misses, then you, that illusion kind of breaks down, right? Then, then uh, basically the goal is to really manage the hierarchy very nicely, very well, so that you don't get uh, into these cache misses. But we all know that that's not easy to do. So in this lecture, we're going to talk about how to manage the cache hierarchy, or caches in particular, specific caches, so that we can actually reduce the cache misses we get. And we're going to look at some ideas in this direction. But unfortunately, we're not going to be able to cover many, many ideas. Many, many interesting ideas have been proposed at the hardware, software, hardware, software, cooperative, and system levels to manage these caches and the memory hierarchy much better. Uh, I'm going to give you a glimpse of that in this lecture. Uh, and if you're interested, I will recommend different lectures uh, that you can refer to. And you can certainly read a lot of papers that are being written on this topic. Uh, and many of the ideas that we're going to discuss are actually uh, placed in existing processors. And uh, actually, uh, more sophisticated versions of them are in uh, existing processors. If you take the advanced computer architecture course, the master's level course, we cover more advanced techniques uh, like prefetching designs, different prefetching designs uh, that improve the performance of this memory hierarchy uh, by trying to maintain the illusion that I mentioned. You get the fast access time almost all the time, uh, but we won't get into that today. I will briefly introduce prefetching at the end of this lecture because it's very important, I think. And the performance of this hierarchy is probably the most important thing uh, to design in existing systems. And we motivated that two lectures ago, if you remember. OK, this is another example of the modern memory hierarchy, maybe expanded a little bit to cover the swap disk uh, on the larger side and to cover the register file on the faster side. Uh, and these are also part of the memory hierarchy, if you remember, I mentioned this, except they're managed in a different ways. Clearly, the register file is managed by the uh, compiler uh, or the programmer uh, and not by the hardware. And uh, the swap disk is managed automatically by the system. And we're going to talk about that uh, when we talk about virtual memory in the next lecture. We're going to talk about how page faults are handled, for example. Uh, uh, so you can think of main memory as a cache for this swap disk as well. Uh, and that's, that's a good way of thinking, because you have this huge swap disk where you can put things that are not used uh, as much out there. And if you need them, you bring them into the main memory, because main memory is also of limited space, right? It's only many, many gigabytes. It's not on the order of terabytes or so. So you can basically expand this idea, actually, to even further disks. So I, what, what is not shown in this hierarchy, but what's happening in industry and research today is you may also have remote memories. You may also have remote storage. So this is a single node. But you may actually have access to some remote storage server, which houses part of your memory and part of your storage. And you may actually bring uh, bring data, for, uh, bring the uh, uh, write the unused data from uh, from this node. When you run out of the swap disk space in this node, you may write it to some remote location in a remote storage server. And whenever you need that data, you bring it back from that remote storage server. That way, you can actually expand your memory capacity 
even to larger and larger terabytes to even petabytes. I imagine that this remote server could be shared by different nodes, different processors as well. So that's happening in modern data centers, actually, in some, this is called disaggregated memory, if you will. And uh, people are basically having memory locally on the nodes where the processing element is, but they also enable access from this processing element, from this processor, multiprocessor, let's say, to a remote storage server where uh, you can actually house part of your memory. And that way you can, you can have access to an even larger uh, physical memory space. And I think that's an uh, interesting development that has happened in the last decade or so uh, that, that is increasing the memory capacity that's available to a single node. And this has been enabled mainly by fast interconnects uh, that, uh, that, uh, uh, that we are able to use today, fast interconnect technology that we are, we are able to use today so that we can connect this, this processor to a remote node, some other processor in a remote node that has very good storage capabilities. And I'm not going to cover that, but that is an expansion of the memory hierarchy beyond the uh, single box that you have that houses your processor, for example. Okay. And this is, if you're interested, you can actually read about this. Uh, you can search for disaggregated memory, for example. Okay, but let's get back to this uh, management of internal caches in a single node. And recall, I'm gonna go through some slides where I've, I'm gonna remind you what we did in the last lecture and so that we can build up to uh, what we're going to cover today. Uh, clearly, we've covered caches, right? We examined a toy example of a cache, started with a direct map cache. And direct map cache, remember, a given main memory block can be placed in only one possible location in the cache. So the mapping is very inflexible. And you can see it in this example that I showed you last time also. Uh, and we made this more flexible. We made it set associative so that, such that a given uh, memory block, main memory block, can be mapped to multiple different uh, locations in the cache. This is called a set of locations. And now you have some flexibility in terms of where you can place uh, the main memory block. And then we also talked about the most flexible mapping version of the cache, which is called fully associative, where you have some limited number of cache blocks and a given main memory block can be placed to any of those number of cache blocks. As a result, you have a lot of flexibility in the placement of uh, where you can put a main memory block. But of course, with flexibility comes responsibility, right? Now the question becomes, uh, which other block do you evict uh, in this fully associative or set associative cache. Now you have more choices. In a direct map cache, uh, you don't have much choice because a main memory block maps to a cache block and some other main memory block maps to that cache block. Uh, uh, and you need uh, one at a, at a given time. And if you need the other one at another time, you need to replace the first one, right? Or you may need to make the decision, okay, I'm going to keep the one inside the cache and I'm going to supply the data directly to the processor. So you don't have much choice in the direct map cache. Uh, uh, you have more choice in the fully associative cache. As a result, you have fewer conflict misses, if you remember the discussion. But now we're going to talk about also policies in terms of how to actually uh, decide what to evict and what to place into the cache. So these are called replacement or eviction policies. Uh, and we're going to talk about some of those policies in this lecture. Okay, so remember, we also uh, showed this picture. This is not the cache we started with, but this is the two-way set associative cache that we built and uh, the cache we started with was a, was a direct map cache. And direct map cache has one, had one column of eight uh, locations or eight blocks. Here we had two columns of four blocks each. As a result, each main memory block could be stored in two possible locations because it would map to a set given the index bits, as you can see over here. So you have a choice uh, to where uh, to place the block. And you can house uh, two different blocks over here block n and block n plus eight, which happen to map to the same index in this particular case in, the, in our toy example. And you can, you can essentially uh, get cache hits on both. But if you have n, n plus eight and n plus 16, and if you are accessing them in a circular pattern, a uh, repeated pattern that way, this cache would not work again because you have only two-way associativity. So we built a four-way associative cache that looked like this uh, and uh, we'd said that likelihood of conflict misses are even lower over here, but the hardware cost and latency is also higher in this cache because we have more comparators, as you can see, and more logic to determine whether you get a cache hit or miss, and more logic to multiplex out the data from the data store uh, from the appropriate way. Just to uh, remind you, these are called ways, right? This is a four-way associative cache because it has four different ways where the data 
a given block can be placed in. Way zero, way one, way two, and way three. They're not marked here, but I mentioned that last time. And then we built up to the fully associative cache where a given mem main memory block can be placed in any location, any cache block inside the cache, and you have full flexibility. And you can see that this is completely content addressable memory at this point, basically. The tag store itself is content addressable memory. You don't have any index bits. There is no indexing going on because there is no need for an index. Uh, any, any, uh, any, any given block address can be anywhere uh, in the cache. As a result, you just directly compare the tags. In this case, in our toy example, it was five bit tags, right? But if you have a 32 bit address uh, and your cache blocks are, let's say, 64 bytes, uh, then you can do the calculation, right? 32 bit addresses, uh, 32 bits. And cache block uh, is if it's byte addressable, uh, a cache block is six bits. Uh, so byte and block is six bits if you have 64 byte cache blocks. So essentially, you have 25 bits, uh, so 26 bits as part of your tag. So these comparators become larger and larger. So you need to do eight 26 bit comparisons to decide whether you get a cache hit. And this is just a toy example. So you have only eight blocks in the cache. But if, what if you had 16,000 blocks in a cache? And today we have very large caches, right? Uh, if you remember the examples, we have 32 megabytes. In some cases, 120 megabyte caches. And it's very easy to see that we actually have 16,000 or even more cache blocks. So if you want to make that fully associative, does it really make sense to do 16,000 comparators where each comparator is 26 bits wide? And that's why fully associative caches are not easy to build. So we try to get the benefits of a largely associative cache. So fully associative cache don't have conflict misses, right? By definition. Uh, well, they may have conflict misses if you, if you mismanage your cache, but uh, fully associative cache, if you manage it well, uh, you, uh, you will not get conflict misses. You really get capacity misses, essentially, because uh, it, you have full flexibility in where to place uh, the data over here. So we're going to get back to that uh, classification of cache misses also. But uh, Building fully associative and large caches is difficult. That's why many large caches, let's say L3 caches, are usually 32-way associative, maybe 64-way associative, but they're not fully associative. And there's another reason why uh, they're not uh, fully associative, because the benefits are diminishing as well. As you increase the associative of the cache while keeping everything else constant, your hit rate increases, uh, but uh, it saturates after some point. This is dependent on your management algorithms as well. So you could argue that you could, dis you could design a much better management algorithm if you have fully associative cache. But the complexity of the management algorithm also increases because now you have actually many, many choices as to what to replace. OK, so uh, more formally, we define the associativity as how many blocks can map to the same index or set. And the benefits is higher hit rate. But uh, the downsides are slower cache access and more expensive hardware. And management becomes also more complex. And you see this kind of curve, if you remember this figure. OK, then we started talking about issues in set associative caches. And I uh, laid out this um, slide uh, to, to more formally define what uh, happens in a cache, basically. You can think of each block in a set having a priority, indicating how important it is to keep the block in the cache. And then the key issue becomes, how do you determine and adjust block priorities? And there are three key decisions that you make in a set, insertion, promotion, and eviction. Eviction is called replacement as well. And insertion is when you insert the block into the cache. What happens to all of the priorities of the blocks in the set at that point in time? This determines where to insert the incoming block and whether or not to insert the block as well. Promotion is what happens to the priorities on a cache hit, because this gives you more information, if you remember. Whether or not, uh, whether you, do you change the block priority? How do you change the block priority? How do you change the priorities of different blocks in a set? And different uh, approaches take different uh, different uh, algorithms take different approaches to both insertion and promotion, as well as eviction and replacement, which is what happens to priorities on a cache miss. Which block do you evict? How do you decide which block to evict? How do you adjust the priorities? And there is a huge design space you can imagine right now. Once you uh, pose the problem this way, you can design an insertion uh, priority management mechanism, a promotion priority management mechanism, an eviction and replacement priority management mechanism. And you can try to co-design all of them, which I would recommend, of course, uh, ideally the decisions you make during insertion, promotion, and eviction are coordinated with each other such that they don't uh, step, on the step on the toes of each other, if you will, and they, make, they don't make contradictory decisions. But uh, there, uh, this is uh, a science and art in the end. And it's very much dependent on your access patterns also, as we will talk uh, about in a little bit. Uh, 
Okay, this is the last slide I left you with yesterday. Uh, and basically we were talking about eviction and replacement policy in particular, but you can apply the ideas to insertion and promotion policies also. In fact, whenever I talk about a, a late, least recently used eviction and replacement policy, for example, I will also make some assumptions about the insertion and promotion policies as well. So uh, as we discussed, which block do you, in the set do you replace on a cash miss? You need to bring a new block into the cache. What block do you replace? And we said that it makes sense to replace the invalid block. If you have an invalid block in the set, it makes sense to replace it because there's free space. There's no need to replace something that's already valid, right? Because you have free space. But if all blocks in the set are valid, then you consult the replacement or eviction policy. And we discussed some cases. So we're going to talk about some of these uh, eviction policies. So random is basically very low hardware cost, potentially. If you know what you're doing, you can make it very low cost. And you randomly pick uh, uh, which block do you uh, replace. So if you have a, a 32 by associative cache, you generate a random number between 0 and 31. And you pick the uh, number, uh, you pick the block in the way that's pointed to by the number. right? And this is clearly low cost. And it may work in some cases, actually. It turns out we're going to talk about in which case it may work, actually. And this is not a bad policy, in fact. FIFO is first in, first out. I'm not going to talk much about that. You can think about it. Usually it doesn't work as well, but there are some access patterns where this may also work. So the, the, you're very much dependent on the access pattern in terms of how to design the eviction and replacement policy and how well what you design works. Because in the end, uh, your access patterns determine the conflict patterns in the set. And uh, you really want to design policies that go well with the access patterns. And again, this. Uh, we also talked about, uh, for example, hybrid replacement policies. If you, if, if, you, if you cannot design a single policy that's good at all access patterns, why not design multiple different policies that are good at different access patterns and choose the one that's working well at that point in time in your cache? So this is very similar to a hybrid branch predictor that we discussed in an earlier lecture, if you remember. A hybrid branch predictor has different algorithms to predict branches that work uh, uh, that work at different, uh, with different accuracies for different types of branches. And you put both algorithms in hardware and you decide which algorithm to use for which branch or at which point in the program. So it's the same idea basically, but the implementations are going to be different, of course. So whenever you have different kinds of behavior in a system, it makes sense to design a hybrid uh, algorithm that takes multiple algorithms and then decide which algorithm to use at a given time. And that's a very fundamental principle. This is called hybrid algorithms or heterogeneous policies, heterogeneous algorithms. And heterogeneity uh, makes sense whenever you have differing behavior like access patterns or branch prediction patterns, et cetera. Okay, we're gonna briefly talk about hybrid replacement also, but I'm not gonna go into the details of implementation, for example. Least recently used actually is one of the commonly used uh, policies, especially in L1 caches, first level caches. And we're going to talk about that a little bit. Uh, the idea is basically to keep in cache uh, the least recently used blocks. And the idea comes from the temporal locality anticipation, right? Basically, the anticipation is that the blocks that are brought to the cache recently are going to, are, are going to be more likely to be reused in the future. Of course, this is assuming a particular access pattern that's called a circular reference pattern. Basically, you keep accessing the uh, least recently used blocks more often. And we're going to look at issues related to this. Uh, not most recently used in approximation of least recently used, but it's a different algorithm also. It's much simpler. We're going to see least recently used is not going to be as simple. Least frequently used is completely different in the sense that now you need to determine the frequency of usage. You need to guess some frequency of usage. In, in least recently used algorithms, uh, assume that uh, recently used, uh, recently used uh, blocks are going to be also frequently used implicitly, but you may actually have a different frequency uh, uh, detection algorithm, for example, based on the past behavior of the blocks. I'm not going to talk about these much, but imagine this also. This, this requires more hardware actually in general. Uh, of course, in all of these policies, you may actually provide software hints as well. I'm not going to talk about that as much, but you can think about software hints um, informing your decision. So remember, we talked about software hints and branch prediction. We said that the so software can provide hints in terms of whether this branch is likely to be taken or likely to be not taken. You can do the same thing over here. Basically, with a load instruction, you can provide a hint bit saying whether this load is going to bring something into the cache that's going to be reused soon into the future. And again, programmer can set that bit or the compiler can set that bit based on some reused analysis that they do 
on their programs, right? So uh, whenever I talk about these policies, think about potential software uh, uh, hints that can be provided to these policies also. And if the software provides a hint saying this block is going to be very valuable, I know based on my program analysis that this block is going to be reused a lot. Then they set that bit. And in the cache, uh, you can actually uh, prioritize that block. This could be part of the insertion policy, right? The insertion policy and the promotion policy and the eviction and replacement policy can take into account this information provided by the software. Okay, and uh, software can provide that information for least uh, frequent use, for example, this, uh, or frequency of use of different blocks that are going to be fetched by different instructions. Least costly to refetch, we're going to talk about that actually. This is something that is uh, maybe uh, less considered uh, in literature, cash literature, but this is also very important because different cash blocks have different costs in terms of uh, where does the cash block come from, right? If you, if you actually evict the cash block, you may need to fetch it from a remote storage server, as we discussed earlier, right? That's very costly. You may need to fetch, fetch, fetch it from the swap disk. That's very costly. You may need to fetch it from the next level. If you evict it from this level, it may actually be present in level three. And maybe that's not as costly as the other one that you need to fetch from a remote storage server, right? So basically, there are different costs in terms of uh, the memory uh, accesses. And it may make sense for the cash replacement policy or eviction policy or the promotion and insertion policies to take into account the cost of a cash miss, not just how many times it's going to be reused, how often it's going to be reused, how close into the future it's going to be reused, basically. So we're going to talk about that because I think this is important and this is often ignored, but critical thinking says that you should not ignore things like this, basically. So hybrid replacement policies, I mentioned this, and then we're going to talk about optimal replacement policy as we go along as well. Okay, uh, so that was a review, but I introduced some new concepts also uh, with this slide, which we left off uh, in the previous lecture. Now let's talk about LRU, least recently used, because this has been... Uh, one of the earliest policies that were proposed, that was that were proposed, and uh, it has been sustained, but it's difficult to implement as you scale to a large uh, number of ways in a set. And the idea is very simple: evict the least recently accessed block. Right? It's a very simple idea, clearly. Uh, but of course, it comes with a problem. Now you need to keep track of access ordering of blocks. So if you want to know the least recently accessed blocks, you really need to keep an ordering of blocks. So if you have a a 16 way associative cache, basically, you need to have an ordering of those blocks in 16 different ways. So let's start simple. Let's start with a two way. Let's start with a direct map cache. In a direct map cache, does LRU make sense? I don't know if anybody is answering, but uh, I will answer basically. That was a rhetorical question, if you will. It doesn't make sense because in a direct map cache, you don't have anything to evict, right? Uh, basically, you don't have a choice as to which one to which. Uh, which uh, block to evict, because you have only a single way, you know what to evict. If you decide to evict a block, you're going to evict the one that's inside the cache. That's it. But a two-way associative cache, replacement policy becomes an issue because now you have a choice as to what to evict. You have something in way zero, something in way one, and you're going to bring some new uh, block into the cache. And you have to decide whether you want to evict the block in way zero or whether you want to evict the block in way one. Okay. Now the question becomes, what kind of hardware do you need to implement LRU perfectly in this case? And in this case, it's simple actually, because you have two things, two possible things to evict. So you can, if you want to uh, keep an ordering between them in terms of which one is the least recently used, you just need one bit to specify which one is the least recently used. And automatically the other one is the not least recently used because only you have two possible things, right? So in this case, it's very simple to implement LRU. So if you go back, for example, to uh, this two-way associative cache that I showed you earlier. This is a two-way associative cache. You just need only one bit to specify which one is the least recently used, right, in a given set. So per set, you, you need one bit. So it's very uh, cost efficient, if you will. But that's two-way only, right? And we said that maybe we want to build larger associative caches. Once you go to four-way associative cache, then the same question arises. How many bits, how, what's the minimum number of bits you need to have to implement LRU perfectly in a given set. Maybe I'll give you some time over here. Let's see if anybody is venturing an answer. I don't know. Uh, I cannot see stuff over here. So there's an answer too. Uh, so uh, I think maybe you're assuming something. 
that's different. I'm, I'm really looking for the minimum in a given set. OK, so maybe I will answer, but you can keep writing the answers. But basically, if you want to keep the full ordering and you have four things in a cache, uh, OK, let me go back to this four-way associative cache. Uh, OK, this is the four-way associative cache. We're looking at only one set, right? Uh, if you want to know uh, which one is the least recently used, there are four possible things that can be least recently used. And then you need to keep the ordering of the next least recently used. Then there are only three possible things that are left for that, right? Uh, then you need to keep the next least recently used. There are only two possible things left. And then you need to keep the least, uh, most recent, uh, uh, I guess, least recently used, let's say. And you need only one thing for that. So this is really a factorial. To, uh, there are only four possible things that can be rec least recently used. And then the next least recently used, you need, uh, once, you, once you decide what's the least recently used, there are, only th there are three possible things that can go to the next least recently used. Once you decide that, there are only two possible things. And then once you decide that, there are only one possible thing. Right? So basically, four factorial. There are four factorial possible orderings for four different blocks. And to encode all possible orderings, because all of them possibly can happen, depending on the way. At a given point, this way may be what's re least recently used. This way may be the next least recently used. This way may be the next recently used. And this way may be the next recently used. You need to basically have the bits to specify that ordering. So it's really four factorial orderings, right? Uh, so if you have four factorial orderings, you need to have log two to the four factorial. And four factorial is four times three times two times one, which is 24. So log two to the uh, 24 is, of course, you need to take, uh, it's, it's basically five, right? You need five bits to specify that. So basically, uh, for, uh, you need five bits to specify uh, the ordering across the blocks. But of course, you need to decode that value to decide actually uh, what uh, to use also, right? Uh, OK, Can, couldn't you use n times log 2n bits uh, where every seed caps? But that's not the minimum. Yes, you could. So the suggestion is. Can you basically use n times log 2 n bits, uh, where n, I assume, is the associativity, uh, where every set uh, keeps track of its order? Yes, you could. But if you do the calculation, a four-way associative cache, that gives you eight bits, right? I was asking for the minimum. Very good. Absolutely. So what the benefit of what you suggest is basically every set uh, can have two bits in that case. Uh, decoding becomes easier, of course. Now you, you can more easily figure out uh, which set is the uh, uh, let's say, least recently used, and you can find the ordering much more easily, but it's not the minimum number of bits. OK, so uh, I, I already answered this, actually. How many different orderings are possible for the full box in a difference in the set? That's four factorial. And if this becomes not like 32-way, it's 32 factorials, which is a huge number, actually. And you have log 2 to the number of 32 factorials, uh, again. Uh, and, uh, and then the next question is, how many bits are needed to encode the LRU order of a block that's log 2 to the n factorial, where n is the number of ways? And then what is the logic needed to determine the LRU victim? Then you need to decode uh, that encoding to find out. OK. OK, are there problems with the sound? OK, uh, I think uh, maybe not. It's fine, people are saying. So somebody is asking, why can't we just assign a number where the highest is the least recently used? Uh, I don't know what that means, uh, frankly, but you need to keep track of an order. So remember that you need to keep track of the order because once you evict the least recently used, you're going to evict next time you're going to evict the next least recently used. If you, if you actually do not keep track of the order, then you're implementing some other policy. Okay, so because of this, basically one of the reasons why LRU is not implemented in, the, in this form uh, by tracking the order of all of the uh, uh, blocks in a set is it's too complex, basically. In highly associative caches, it becomes too complex to keep track. But this is not the only reason. Basically, modern processors do not implement true LRU, also called perfect LRU, where they keep the order of all of the cache blocks in highly associative caches. And one reason is true LRU is complex. But there is another reason. LRU is an approximation to predict locality or reuse anyway. So basically, this is, is this, LRU is assuming some access pattern where the most recently used block is going to uh, be uh, reused again soon. right? And that's not necessarily true in many access patterns, basically. So while LRU is an interesting policy to think about conceptually, just like we did in the previous slide, it's complex. And it's not necessarily the best thing anyway in terms of management algorithms. So as a result, modern processors implement some approximations. For example, they do not most recently used. They evict the not most recently used block. So this way, 
uh, this way, the, the, the amount of hardware you need is much smaller, right? You just need to keep track of what is the most recently used block in a cache, most recently used weight in a cache. And this is much easier to do in a largely, a high, highly associative cache, like 64 weights, for example, right? You just need six bits in 64 ways to keep track of uh, which block is the most recently used, right? And then you evict one of the other ones randomly, potentially. Or you can do hierarchical LRU. Basically, people have looked at hierarchical LRU mechanisms where they don't keep track of the order completely. They don't have a, a total order, basically. They have a small, uh, 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 basically, they break the total order in, in a hierarchy. And they also have other mechanisms like victim, next victim replacement, where, where they only keep track of the victim and the next victim. And victim could be, could be the uh, least recently used, and next victim could be something else, for example. Uh, but these are approximations to the LRU. I'm not going to go into the details of it. You can, you can watch some earlier cache lectures that I'm going to point you to later if you're really interested in how these implementations are done. But uh, the takeaway is uh, people, uh, in general, modern processors implement uh, different policies that approximate LRU. And we will see that they may actually do something completely different, actually. OK, so uh, let's take a look at uh, a comparison between LRU and random. Which one's better? And this is an interesting thought exercise. Uh, so let's take a look at uh, a four-way cache. We have cyclic references to A, B, C, D, E. So basically, you're referencing blocks A, B, C, D, E, A, B, C, D, E, A, B, C, D, E. And they're all mapping to the same set, which means that if you have least recently used management, perfect least recently used management, you get 0% hit rate, right? Because you don't have enough uh, blocks to house this. You're always evicting the thing that you're going to use soon because you you're thrashing. Essentially, this is called set thrashing. When the program working set in a set is larger than the set associativity. In this case, A, B, C, D, E is five blocks. And the set associativity is four blocks, four ways. So you're thrashing that particular set. And your working set is A, B, C, D, E in a cyclic pattern. If, it, if the pattern is different, maybe you get some other hit rate. But the, if the pattern is this circular reference pattern, you'll get 0% hit rate with LRU. In this case, random replacement policy is actually better when thrashing occurs, when this sort of thrashing occurs. So in practice, actually, performance of the replacement policy, as I mentioned, depends very much on the workload and access patterns. And it turns out, across many, many studies, average hit rate of LRU and then random are similar in L1 caches, and sometimes in L2 caches also. So this is very interesting, because it turns out this thrashing behavior exists, and cyclic reference patterns do not, norm normally, uh, do not always exist, uh, well, uh, that fits into the uh, that do not trash the sets. As a result, random doesn't do badly, actually. And this is the average across many studies, which is very interesting. But of course, LRU and random are actually uh, uh, catering to different access patterns. Uh, as a result, maybe you want the best of both worlds. So why does random do better over here? So if you think about it, you have A, B, C, D, E, and you have a four-way cache. Let's assume that you have A, B, C, D in your cache. And you randomly decide what to evict. You don't evict A. When you, when you bring in E, you don't evict A because it's, it's the most least recently used. You may evict D. If you evict D, you bring in E. And then when you have access to, uh, when you access A, it becomes a cache hit, right? So random, randomly keeps some blocks in the cache that are going to be referenced. Whereas LRU, this is really a, a very problematic access pattern for LRU, essentially. In fact, it could be the worst access pattern. Okay. So you can have a hybrid of LRU and random, and this is a hybrid replacement policy that caters for different access patterns. Random is good for set thrashing. LRU is good for access patterns that are LRU friendly, let's say. In fact, that's, that's a term that's used in the literature, LRU friendly access patterns. Uh, and if you want to actually get the best of both worlds, maybe you implement both. And then uh, one way of actually deciding which one to use is on a, on a per set basis, you do some sampling, or on a cache basis, you do some sampling, and you decide that uh, you basically keep track of which policy is doing better. And then you apply the policy that's doing better to the entire cache or to portions of the cache or to particular sets. This idea is called set sampling. It basically samples which policy is doing better over time. It could also sample over space, basically, in terms of which sets. And, the, and, and basically, it's, it uses the policy that's doing better based on that sampling information. And I'm not going to go through the details of how it's implemented. You can certainly look at papers. This is a recommended, it's going to be a recommended paper that I'm going to talk about uh, briefly. Uh, okay, isn't, uh, there's one question. Isn't random the only way to prevent the existence of a reference pattern that guarantees 0% uh, 
hit rate. So I didn't quite understand the question. That guarantees a non-zero percent hit rate, maybe? Uh, well, uh, I, I'm not sure, basically. I, uh, I think you can actually implement other policies that uh, ensure that uh, you don't necessarily get a zero percent hit rate. This is particularly uh, a bad pattern for LRU in particular. I don't think you need ne random necessarily uh, to keep, uh, to basically uh, uh, get a, get a non-zero percent hit rate in this particular case. So there's one other question. Does every uh, cache L1 through L3 use different uh, policy? So uh, we're going to get back to this actually, but the answer is yes, because the, diff the locality that's experienced in different caches uh, is different. Because if you think about the L1 cache, it gets exposed to all of the requests coming from the processor. But L2 cache gets exposed to requests only that miss in, uh, the, those requests that miss in the L1 cache. L3 cache gets exposed to requests that miss in the L2, L2 cache. That's why they see different types of locality potentially, and it makes sense to design different policies. OK, let's talk about the optimal replacement policy. But this is, uh, so uh, I, should, I should say that this, this replacement policy is optimal in terms of minimizing the miss rate. Whenever you talk about optimal, you should talk about what you're optimizing for, right? And this replacement policy was developed by Bellady in, this, in a famous paper. It's called the opt policy, but it's optimal for minimizing the miss rate. Later, we're going to see an example where uh, we, minim, uh, we, we talk about performance. And the idea in the optimal replacement policy is to replace the block that's going to be referenced furthest into the future by the program. And this makes sense. You can actually prove it. And this was actually proposed. Uh, by virtual, mem virtual to physical memory systems by Bellady in this seminal paper. Of course, there are many interesting questions. You cannot implement this because this requires you to look into the future. You may guess, you may predict. Even simulation of this is not easy, actually. I'm not going to go into the details of this. And the question I already answered is, is this optimal for minimizing the miss rate? And the answer is yes. You can convince yourself of that. Is this optimal for minimizing the execution time? You should now think about, uh, I already mentioned earlier in earlier lectures that latency or miss rates are not the same as execution time because there's a lot of uh, other things going on. For example, this doesn't consider the missed latency, right? Or missed cost. How, how long will it take to refetch the data? As a result, this is not optimal for minimizing the execution time because cache miss latency or cost varies from block to block. And we're going to look at that. And as we discussed, there are multiple reasons for it, but. Uh, you may actually have remote versus local caches. Uh, to, so one block, you may actually fetch it from the next level of cache. One block, you may have to go to the remote caches. Or there may be overlapping. One block, whenever you fetch it, there's no overlapping. So the latency is not hidden. Uh, but uh, what, another block you fetch, there's a lot of latency overlapping. As a result, the latency of the fetching is hidden, as we have discussed earlier. And this, these issues are discussed in this paper, which we're going to briefly talk about. And I'm going to recommend you to take a look. So that's the recommended reading. Basically, this paper shows that some misses are more costly than others as their latency is exposed as stall time to the processor. In the end, what matters is whether the processor stalls, right? If you have a miss and the processor doesn't stall as much, maybe it's not that important, right? But if you have a miss that stalls the processor for hundreds of cycles, maybe you should really reduce that miss, right? Uh, so reducing the miss rate is not always good for performance and cache replacements should take into account the cost and latency and overlapping of misses. So I'm going to give you an example of this, uh, hopefully, when we get to it. But let's now uh, go back to a tax store entry. So remember, we were talking about tax store. And each tax store entry has a valid bit and a tag for sure. It also needs replacement policy bits to implement a replacement policy. And we discussed, uh, for example, LRU may be implemented in different ways, right? What about a dirty bit? We mentioned this last time. But let's talk about it a little bit more formally right now. Dirty bit basically says, this block was modified, updated inside the cache. And whether or not you need this bit depends on a decision you make in your caches, whether the cache is right back or right through. And we're going to talk about that now. So basically, the question is this. When do we write the modified data in a cache to the next level? Right through cache means the, uh, whenever you write the data into the cache, you also write it to the next level of the cache. And then maybe the next level of cache, and maybe the next level. So right through means you write through the cache. Write back means uh, you write to this cache, let's say level one cache, but you don't write it to the next level of cache until the block is evicted. And these clearly have different uh, implications on performance as well as complexity. So write back, uh, clearly in a write through cache, you don't need a dirty bit. 
right? Because you've already written the data into all of the levels of caches, uh, assuming all your caches are right through, but to the next level of cache if you're looking at one level. In a right back cache, you do need a dirty bit or modified bit to specify that this block was modified so that you can write it back to the next level when the block is actually evicted, right? So, but the, the, the performance advantage of a write back cache is you can combine multiple writes to the same block before eviction. So let's say you're doing a streaming write. Streaming might means, yeah, let's say you have a 64 byte cache block and you start writing uh, every single byte in the cache block. And you, you use different instructions to do that, those writes. So let's assume that you do store, store bytes. So 64 bytes and each store actually does one byte store. That's 64 stores. So if you actually have a write through cache, you, every time you do a store of uh, a single byte, you have to do a store to the next level of the cache as well. Now this, this causes a lot of bandwidth between cache levels and it causes a lot of energy because you need to exercise the interconnect between the cache levels. But a write back cache avoids this because it can combine multiple writes to the same blocks before evicting it. No other cache knows about these writes except for the L1 cache, okay? So that's the beauty of a write back cache. But the downside is now you, have, you need a bit in the tax store indicating the block is dirty or modified. And that's the price you pay. Now, write through cache is simpler design because it doesn't need that bit. All levels are up to date and consistent. So whenever you do a write, all levels have the correct copy of the data, assuming all, all levels are right through, right? Now, there's a beauty in this. You get simpler cache coherence. We're going to talk about cache coherence toward the end of the lecture also briefly. But basically, whenever you have multiprocessors, there's no need to check close to processor caches, text stores for presence uh, of a location because you actually know that all levels are up to date, OK? So keep this in mind. Uh, if you're interested in cache coherence, we have uh, further lectures. Uh, and you may have seen some of this in parallel programming, uh, by the way. OK, but the downside of write-through is it's very bandwidth intensive. There's no combining of writes. In cases where you're doing a lot of writes to a cache block before you're evicting it in a write-back cache, write-through exposes all of those updates to all of the cache levels that are write-through. And that's a big downside, actually. So in today's caches, there could be uh, write-back is actually used commonly. But in some caches, write through is used. So you may have a write through cache in the L1 level, but you may have a write back cache in a shared cache level, L2 level or L3 level, for example, so that you don't write through to memory, for example. And that tries to get the advantages of both. But uh, of course, there are still downsides at each given level that uh, doesn't implement write back, for example, in terms of bandwidth. OK, there's another question that arises with writes. Uh, whenever you're, let's say, let's, and this question arises in an L1 cache, basically. Whenever you're doing a store to a uh, location and this, this store misses in the cache, then the question is, do you actually bring a cache block into the cache and allocate it uh, on, a, uh, on, a, on a write miss? Actually, this question exists on a read miss also, but write misses are interesting because uh, you may not uh, re-reference the block after a write uh, that much. And if, uh, uh, basically, if you answer the question yes, then you're allocating a block on a write miss in your cache. If you answer this question no, then you're not allocating a block on a write miss. And this leads to different design decisions. I'm going to go through this quickly. But if you allocate a block on a write miss, then you can do the combi combination of writes that we talked about. You can combine writes uh, to a full cache block instead of writing each of them individually to the next level. Right? So imagine that you, alloc you allocated the cache block, 64 bytes, uh, and you basically write to every single uh, byte uh, in the example that I showed you earlier. If you don't allocate the cache block, then you have to go to the next level to do the write. Right. OK, so the store. When I say write, it's store, actually. Uh, and this is simpler because write misses can be treated the same way as read misses. Basically, whenever you miss in the cache, you bring the block uh, that you're referencing into the cache. But, uh, and that's the allocate on write miss. The downside of this is it requires a transfer of the whole cache block. So recall that you have 64 bytes. You're transferring. Uh, and you just, you just want to write to one location, let's say one byte, and you're not going to reuse that block at all. Now there's a downside here. You're bringing 64 bytes from memory and allocate into the cache, and you're just updating one byte, and you're not going to reuse that block at all for reads or writes again. Now this is problematic because you transfer the entire cache block essentially just to write to a one byte of it. And this is not going to be good if you're allocating on write misses. So if you're not allocating on write misses, basically uh, you don't have this problem. You conserve cache space if locality of writes is low 
and you get potentially better cash hit rate. So basically, the example that I showed you is uh, an example where I mentioned to you is an example where the locality of the uh, writes is low. Essentially, uh, you bring 64 bytes, but you write only uh, one byte. OK, there's another uh, issue in handling writes. And uh, uh, this is going to actually bring us to another different cache design. What if the processor writes to an entire block over a small amount of time? So basically, is, then the question is, is there any need to bring the block into the cache from memory in the first place? So imagine a scenario where you have 64 bytes cache block, and you have 64 stores, each writing to one byte. And you're going to do a streaming write. You're going to write to the entire cache block. So does it really make sense to bring the data that you're going to overwrite completely? And the answer is no, right? Because you're going to completely overwrite this cache block. Why do you need to read it from memory? Why not just allocate the cache block and do a streaming write to the entire cache block? And that's the, that's the idea, basically. Can we, actually, uh, can we actually design a cache that gets the benefit of this, that doesn't bring the entire cache block whenever we're writing to a, to, to a full cache block from the processor? So basically, why do we not simply write to a portion of the block and designate that portion as a sub-block and then not bring the data from memory because we don't need to know what was, it, what was in memory. We're just writing to that location, right? We're not reading from that location. We don't need to uh, uh, really uh, bring the data from memory in the first place. We just update the sub-block. So for example, if the store is doing a four byte write, your sub-block can be four bytes. And you basically write to those four bytes and don't bring those four bytes and the remaining 60 bytes from the cache. That makes a lot of sense, I think. But the problem is, in the cache design that we proposed earlier, valid and dirty bits are associated with the entire 64 bytes, not with each individual four bytes. Now we need to change the design of the cache. And that's the idea of the sub-blocked and sector caches, which is used in industry actually heavily for the reasons that we're going to, we have discussed and we're going to reinforce again. Basically, in a sub block cache or sector cache, the idea is to still keep a block. Basically, you still have a tag associated with the entire block, 64 byte block, let's say. But we divide the block into sub-blocks or sectors. And we have a separate valid and dirty bits for each sub-block or sector. So in this particular figure, I have, let's say, uh, let's say I have 64 byte blocks and I have uh, 32 sub-blocks. Oh, OK, uh, that didn't work well. Let's go back to this example. I have 64 byte blocks and I'm writing four bytes at a time. So I have 16 sub-blocks, right? If I have 16 sub-blocks, I have 16. I replicate the valid and dirty bits 16 times for each sub-block. But the tag is for the entire block. So we're not reducing the block size. We still have the same block size, but we're partitioning the block into smaller chunks called sub-blocks so that we can do better management. We can avoid the problem that I mentioned over here. You write to an entire block. You don't need to bring the block. You just write to the sub-block, basically. So basically, we allocate only a sub-block or a subset of sub-blocks, if you wish, on a request. And if you do this, there is no need to transfer the entire cache block into the cache. If you're doing a write, and the write is the granularity of the write is a sub-block, let's say four bytes, you just write to the sub-block, make the valid bit one, make the dirty bit one, and write the tag over here. And every other sub-block is not valid and not dirty, basically. This way, you can create the cache block inside your cache because while you're writing to it, right? So that's a big advantage of this. So a write simply validates and updates a sub-block and also the tag, of course, but no other sub-block remains touched. You know, whenever you access another sub-block with a read request, for example, the tag matches, but the valid bit doesn't match. As a result, you get a cache miss on the sub-block, right? Now we're trying to get the benefits of a larger block while managing the larger block at a smaller granularity because we don't want the disadvantages that we mentioned in the earlier slides. OK, now you have more freedom in transferring sub-blocks into the cache. A cache block does not need to be in the cache fully. It could be in the cache partially. And any sub-block can be in the cache, basically. OK, and you can also decide to fetch sub-blocks, uh, fetch from the memory or the next level in a sub-block granularity. So this gives you more freedom, basically, in your cache management. How many sub-blocks do you transfer on a read, for example? You may not need to transfer any sub-block on a write, for example. You may decide, OK, I'm just going to write to the sub-block because I don't need the data anyway. The processor is not reading that sub-block. It's just writing the sub-block. OK, the downside, of course, now you can do the calculations, if you will. Uh, more complex design, obviously, right? Now you need valid and dirty bits per sub-block. Uh, 
Tag doesn't increase. That's the good part. That's the advantage of the sectoring. That's the difference between a sub-block cache and a small block size. The tag size is the same as the large block size. OK, but of course, the downside is you may not exploit spatial locality fully because you're not bringing the entire sub-block. Right? Uh, that's the downside. But of course, this, this gives you more freedom in cache management. So you may actually come up with a better algorithm to decide which sub-blocks to bring. OK, uh, so let's talk a little bit more. And then I'm going to take a break. And then we're going to continue. Uh, let's talk about some of these design choices and come to a good point uh, to take a break. So hopefully, this is very interesting. Sub-blocking opens another possibility in managing the cache at a finer granularity while preserving the advantages, some advantages of the large blocks. Right. OK, uh, there's another question. Is it helpful to choose different strategies for different levels? Absolutely, yes. Basically, I think this is going to come again. Uh, absolutely. Uh, OK, so instruction versus data caches. The question is, should they be separate or unified? And I mentioned this last time, so I'm not going to go through this in a lot of detail again. But if you have unified caches, the good thing is you have dynamic sharing of cache space between instructions and data. No over-provisioning happens with static part that happens with static partitioning. So if you statically partition, let's say you have a total of 128 kilobytes cache space. Do you put instructions and data and dynamically manage that cache? Or do you divide into 64 kilobyte instruction cache and 64 kilobyte data cache? Now, whenever you do static partitioning, you may have over-provisioning. For example, you, you decided you have a 64 kilobyte iCache, instruction cache, but instruction working set is only, I don't know, one kilobyte. So you're wasting 63 kilobytes in that cache that's not going to be used by data. But your data working set, the amount of data that you need in the cache at a given time may be 128 kilobytes or 127 kilobytes, let's say, just to make the example uh, fit nicely. Your data cache is trashing. And there's free space in the instruction cache, but you cannot use it because these are separate caches. So a unified cache doesn't have this problem. So it gives you a dynamic partitioning and sharing of the cache space. As a result, you may accommodate the one kilobyte instruction set instructions a uh, set of instructions and uh, 127 kilobytes of data inside the same cache. But if you partition it, you have a problem. But the downside of your unified cache instructions and data can evict or trash each other. There's no guaranteed space for either. As a result, when you don't have this nice situation, they may actually thrash each other and destroy your performance potential. Okay. So this is actually very general resource partitioning versus resource sharing. Whenever you partition the resources, you're more flexible. You can accommodate things better. Whenever you, uh, so whenever you share the resources, you can, you're more flexible. Uh, uh, you don't have over-provisioning. And whenever you partition your resources, you get better quality of service, if you will, to the things that you dedicate the resources to, in this case, instructions versus data. OK, so there's another uh, important thing that I mentioned, actually, in the last uh, lecture. Instructions and data are accessed in different places in the pipeline. So if you have a unified cache, it's hard to place the unified cache for fast access. And this is why L1 caches, level 1 caches that are close to the processor are actually almost always separate. Instructions are accessed in the fetch stage. Data is accessed in the load unit. As a result, you want them in different places in the pipeline, as we will see in some of the pictures of real processors also. So first level caches are almost always split between instructions and data, mainly for the last reason about pipeline constraints. Remember. When we talk about first double cache, I said first double caches dictate, are, the, the design of the first double cache is dictated by the pipeline. And this is an example of it. Higher level caches like L2, L3, L4, L5 are usually unified because uh, you don't get a lot of benefits uh, distinguishing between instructions and data. But there are some uh, special cases where they were not unified uh, as well. OK. Uh, uh, this, uh, I think this question arose multiple times, so I'm going to cover this also because uh, basically, the uh, question was, how do you design different uh, caches and di different algorithms? And clearly, you have first-level cache, second-level cache, third-level cache, et cetera. And you may make different choices in the design of these caches. So first-level caches are instruction and data. They're usually separate. Decisions are very much affected by cycle time. As a result, they're usually small, lower associativity, and latency is critical. Uh, and the management algorithms are based on what is needed by the processor, basically, so that you can do things quickly. You have very little time to decide wh uh, where to insert into the cache, for example. And also, tag store and data store are usually accessed in parallel concurrently. Remember, we discussed this. Do we index into the tag store and the data store in parallel? I said I'm going to talk about it in the next lecture in more detail. In this case, you can, because you need the data right away. You don't want to increase latency. Second level cache, on the other hand, you may have, you have more freedom. 
you have more time or third level cache, you have even more time because the processor is waiting anyway. Maybe it can wait a little bit longer so that you can actually optimize something else, right? So basically in second level cache, decisions need to balance hit rate and access latency. You're not as much affected by the cycle time of the processor because you're not as tightly integrated into the pipeline. As a result, these caches are usually large and highly associative and latency is not as important. I didn't say impo not important. I said not as important as the first level caches. Remember the equation that we looked at hierarchical latency analysis? Clearly latency is important at any level, right, in the end, but maybe not as important at this level. And in this case, tax store and data store can be accessed serially. Why? Because Im imagine having, a, a, let's say, a 32 megabyte cache uh, and uh, you have 32-way associative, uh, and uh, you access the cache, you do a parallel access to tag store and data store, only to find out that the cache misses. You basically wasted the access to the data store. You fired up all these data store ways that are huge, 64 bytes each, right? You're basically firing up 64 bytes times 32 ways, and you're indexing into a huge array to fire them up only to find out that the tag store missed in the cache. So nothing you did in the data store is useful. So basically this is very energy inefficient. As a result, in many cases, large last level or next level, uh, large caches essentially, large and highly associative caches, uh, tag store is accessed first, and then the data store is accessed next. Because once you access the tag store, you know exactly which way you matched. You don't need to fire up all of the data store ways. You just need to access that way that you matched in or access nothing if you actually are, if you missed in the tax store, right? So hopefully this is clear. This is a very important design decision. And this gives you an example of why uh, the design decisions are also different between first level, second level, and third level caches. And of course the management algorithms can be different at different levels also. The next question is of course, serial versus parallel access of levels. Do you actually start the second level cache access until you know the first level misses or do you do it speculatively early on? Okay, usually you start the next level access uh, after you know you have an indication of whether this first level is going to miss or not so that you can save energy. But if, you are, if, you, if you're likely that you're going to miss, you may start the next level access earlier. You may actually do a prefetch request to the memory system. So as a result, second level, uh, accesses don't use, uh, second level caches don't see the same accesses as the first and this true increasingly to the later levels. So first level cache acts as a filter it really filters some temporal and spatial locality, basically. And management policies and different caches are therefore quite different uh, from each other. Okay, I'm not gonna go through the management policies here, but we will talk about them in a little bit. But uh, I will show you some pictures of these different cache hierarchies. So you can see actually that inside the cores, people don't even show the L1 caches over here usually because they're tightly integrated into the core, but other caches are here. And you can see over here that a huge chunk of the uh, system in AMD Ryzen is L3 caches and L2 caches. L1 caches are separate. I think there's a mislabeling over here, L1i and L1d, uh, but you can take a look at that. And you can see that uh, nobody usually shows the L1 caches uh, in, in the system. But this is to show you that these caches uh, are a hierarchy and the management algorithms as well as how they're designed and how they're integrated into the core are very different from each other as well. So we already talked about actually uh, uh, I, I will mention one thing in NVIDIA Ampere and then we're going to take a break. But in NVIDIA Ampere, for example, you have both, you have, you have some memory, L1 memory, let's say, 192 kilobytes for streaming multiprocessor that can be used as either cache or scratch pad based on the programmer's discretion. So the programmer can decide how to use that memory. So that's actually very interesting, I think. And L2 cache is large and shared across many, many processors. And they actually have features that have been added to the new NVIDIA processor where you can do direct copy from L2 to Scratchpad, for example, bypassing L1 and the register file. So you can basically bypass different levels of caches depending on the reuse behavior uh, of your programs. And this can be controlled by the programmer. But in some existing uh, processors, for example, Intel and IBM processors, this sort of bypassing or priority determination of the cache blocks also happen. They're decided by the hardware internally, not exposed to the programmer. Okay. So this is a great place to uh, take a break. Feel free to add, add more questions uh, if you want. So we're gonna take a 10 minute break and start at 1525. Uh, and then we'll continue our exploration of caches. Okay, I think we can start. I'll take two questions uh, before we start. Uh, well, uh, while we start. 
uh, basically the one question says, can we bypass the later caches and direct the access to memory controller, for example? So certainly, yes. I mean, this depends on the uh, design choice that you have. You can certainly make a lot of design choice in the hierarchy, decide which caches to access, which caches not to access. But you got to be careful, of course, if you are doing that, uh, because you may actually make a wrong choice and you may, be, you may need to be careful because the caches that, are, that you're bypassing to directly access memory uh, may have more up-to-date data. So basically, uh, given the constraints of the hierarchy, as long as you don't get the wrong data, you can make uh, any choice you want in the design. And then there's one more question. How do we know where to look for the data in the upper level cache, memory on a cache miss, especially in caches with high associativity? How is the original memory address related to the cache location tag or vice versa? Well, it's the same thing as the cache we looked at. The toy example, you need to form uh, a, a cache index and a cache tag based on the address and based on the characteristic of the cache. And then you look up the cache based on the index and the tag. There's nothing different or nothing. Uh, yeah, there's nothing different between any level of cache in terms of the access, basically. And we're assuming physical address in this case, uh, the virtual and physical addresses we're going to talk about later. OK, uh, given that, now let's move into cache performance a little bit more. Uh, I'm going to go through some of these slides relatively quickly because we already talked about some of these things. But certainly, cache parameters affect the miss and hit rate, cache size, block size, associativity, and the replacement, insertion, and promotion policies. They all affect your miss and hit rate, right? So cache size is a big one. Uh, assuming everything else is equal, having a bigger cache is usually helpful. It increases hit rate, as you can see over here uh, on this. Uh, I guess, cartoonish picture. And usually cache size is specified without including the tag capacity. So when you talk about a 32 megabyte cache, you don't normally include the tag store size. It's usually the data store size. That's how, that's the convention basically. Because if you include the tag store size, it's going to be a different number that's not as nice as 32 megabytes, for example. Uh, and in your homework, you'll do some calculations in terms of uh, cache tag store sizes, for example. Usually, as you have a larger cache, you can keep more things into the, in the cache. And usually, you can exploit temporal locality better. But not always, right? For example, uh, you may actually reduce set thrashing if you actually make the size some amount. So the function, uh, function can be nonlinear, basically. This function that's depicted over here can be nonlinear. Once you get to a cache size that's nice, your hit rate may jump, for example, because now you get rid of thrashing in the cache assuming everything else is equal. So basically, it's not a line linear function necessarily, uh, but usually monotonic, uh, usually monotonically increasing, usually increasing, basically. So of course, the too large of a cache adversely affects hit and miss latency. What's not depicted here is the hit and miss latency. And we already know that. Access time may degrade the critical path, potentially, if, they, if you have an L1 cache. But too small of a cache doesn't exploit temporal locality well. Useful data is replaced often. So you need to make uh, good design choices clearly across the hierarchy. Working set, we use this term. I never really fully defined it, so let's define it. It's really the whole set of data the executing application references within a time interval. So basically, if your working set is, let's say, 32 megabytes and your cache size is 32 megabytes, then you, you, you fit your working set into the cache, and that may be a good thing. You don't access memory after that, right? Assuming if you're going to work on that data for a long time, right? OK, so working set is a good way of thinking about the cache size as well. So block size uh, is the data that's associated with an address tag. And this clearly affects the spatial locality that's exploited of the cache. And uh, basically, assuming the cache size is constant, as you increase the block size, you usually get a curve that looks like this average across many applications. Basically, your hit rate increases uh, because you're exploiting better spatial locality. And after some time, your hit rate starts reducing because your block sizes are becoming bigger. And you're not exploiting spatial locality very well. And you're also having fewer blocks in your cache, because we're assuming the cache size is the same, right? You have to keep something constant uh, over here, and cache size is kept constant over here, OK? So basically, uh, this is not necessarily the unit of transfer between hierarchies. It's good to know that. Subblocking, remember subblocking? A block is divided into multiple pieces, each with its own valid and dirty bits. That could be the unit of transfer between different caches and the memory hierarchy. But if you have two small blocks, you don't exploit spatial locality well and have a larger tag overhead as well. So there's one other downside of two small blocks. If you have two large blocks, then you have too few total number of blocks in your cache, assuming the cache size is kept constant. And as a result, you get less temporal locality exploitation, even though you may be getting good spatial locality within a given block. Okay? And also, you, get waste, uh, you waste the cache space and bandwidth and energy if the spatial locality is not high. Right? If you have a very long block, let's say your block size is one kilobytes or four kilobytes, 
you waste a lot of bandwidth and energy bringing the block and cache space. And usually you don't have that good spatial locality in many applications. Okay, uh, large blocks, large cache blocks actually can take a long time to fill into the cache. So people have developed the idea of critical work first. Fill the cache block critical work first. So if you have a sub block cache, for example, you bring the critical sub block first, for example. You supply the critical data to the processor immediately because that's critical data is the data that's needed by the processor at that point in time. That's the reason why you have the cache miss in the first place. Anything else around it in the same block, you don't need it immediately. But this data uh, within the block is the thing that you need immediately. And that needs to be supplied to the processor immediately. And that may be anywhere in the block, right? It may be the first sub block. It may be the 10th sub block. It may be the last sub block. So usually uh, systems are designed such that you, uh, you fetch the critical data from memory first, and then you fetch the remaining parts of the block. And this makes sense because so that the goal is not to stall the processor as long. Large cache blocks can waste bus bandwidth clearly and bandwidth across the memory hierarchy because you're bringing, let's say, four kilobyte blocks. That's very large, of course, or 256 byte blocks as opposed to 16, uh, 16 byte or 64 byte blocks. And the idea of dividing a block into sub blocks is useful in this case also. And we already talked about this idea sub blocks, right? Sub blocks or sectored caches are also called sectors. We associate a separate valid and dirty bit for each sub block. And we call when this is useful, you can remember that. You can basically bring only one sub block into the cache that you need at that point in time, and then decide which sub blocks bring. Or you can predict which sub blocks are going to be accessed and predict bring only those sub blocks. Clearly, this may be good for your cache management, uh, but of course, it complicates the design a little bit. Okay, associativity, we already talked about it a lot. This is basically how many blocks can be present in the same index, i.e., same set. And we, you already seen this picture average across many things, but this is not a per workload picture. This is an average picture. Larger associativity is usually leads to lower miss rate because of reduced conflicts, but it also leads to higher hit latency and area cost plus diminishing returns from associativity. Smaller associativity is usually lower cost and lower hit latency. And this is especially important for L1 cache. So usually L1 caches are lower associate, smaller associativity, whereas L2, L3, L4 caches have very high associativity, uh, but not fully associative because fully associative means uh, you search uh, be, uh, among 32,000 blocks, for example. That's a lot. And then the question becomes, uh, there, there's a fun question that may actually uh, come up uh, in some cases. Is power of two associativity required? It'd be good to have a raise of hands for people who say yes or no. Uh, this may be a trick question, if you will. But it's not a trick question if you understand the uh, cache structure, right? And the answer is no over here, basically. If you said no, that's great. Uh, but basically, Associativity is really search that you're doing within a set, how many comparators you have. You're not indexing into the cache in any way based on associativity, right? Index is something else. So remember, this is our four-way associative cache. We have four comparators, and we have logic to determine the hit and logic to determine the select bits of this MUX, which could be implemented in multiple different ways. If you remember our combinational logic lecture, this could be implemented you know, using tri-state buffers also, or pass gates, et cetera. But now I'm going to remove one way. This is a three-way cache. And it works fine, perfectly. Nothing differs, basically. So a three-way cache is possible, basically. And address doesn't change also, as you can see. OK, and this was our fully associative cache, eight-way fully associative cache. Seven-way fully associative cache is also possible, as you can see, right? You just remove one way. That's it from the data store and the tag store. Everything works fine as long as you don't uh, select uh, the, uh, this thing that doesn't exist over here. So this is still an eight-to-one max, except you're using only seven uh, of the inputs. You should make sure that you don't select the last input clearly if that's the case, right? OK, there's one question. In this example, we assume the memory has two of the eight address. Yes, this is our toy example. We're continuing our toy example from uh, last uh, uh, lecture, basically. Uh, wait, I, I don't know, actually, if it's two of the eight addresses. But uh, yes, I think two of the eight uh, bytes, essentially. Uh, OK. OK, so let's classify the cache misses. Uh, essentially, we've kind of talked about this, but now I'm going to formalize it a little bit. But there are three types of cache misses. Actually, there are four types. A coherence miss, potentially, but that arises in multiprocessors. So I'm not going to talk about that here. But if you actually take the multiprocessors lecture or watch the multiprocessor lecture, we talk about coherence misses a lot, for example. But uh, compulsory capacity and conflict misses. And let's take a look at them. Compulsory misses is essentially the first reference to an address uh, always results in a miss, unless you're doing prefetching, of course. This is the first reference to a block. It's not in the cache. 
because you didn't fetch it before. And subsequent reference should hit unless the cache block is displaced for any of the reasons below, either due to a capacity miss or a conflict miss. Right? So a first miss is always, always compulsory. The first time you access a block, block A, it's compulsory, unless you prefetched it for some reason. And we're going to talk about prefetching hopefully toward the end. Capacity miss is, uh, misses happen because cache is too small to hold everything that's needed. You have a 32 kilobyte cache, and your, uh, your working set is 35 kilobytes, for example. Right? This is, our, this is defined as the misses that would occur even in a fully associative cache with the optimal replacement of the same capacity. Okay, so basically, you uh, this is how it's defined formally. And you can think about it uh, because you eliminate the conflict the potential uh, uh, because you can classify a cache miss as capacity miss, conflict miss. How do you classify it? And this is the definition of a capacity miss. Conflict miss is actually anything that is not compulsory and not capacity basically, and not coherence also. But we're not talking about coherence here. So basically, this is a good way of thinking about uh, cache misses. And then the question becomes, how do you reduce different types uh, of misses? And we're going to talk about that a little bit. So compulsory misses, caching cannot help, basically. This is the first reference to a cache block. You need to do something else to avoid it, essentially. Avoid a cache miss on that one. So prefetching can. And prefetching, essentially, the idea is to anticipate which blocks will be needed soon and bringing them into the cache before you need them. Okay, and we're going to hopefully talk about that a little bit more detail. So conflict, more associativity can help, of course, for conflict misses. Other ways to get more associativity without making the cache more associative can help. I'm going to give you one idea uh, very quickly. I'm not going to talk about this in detail. You can watch some lectures about it. But uh, the way we talked about associativity is associativity in space, right? We said you have a, a four-way associative cache, and you have four ways in the cache in a set, right? This is a spatial uh, view of the cache, but you can also have associativity in time, meaning uh, you, can, you can query the cache with one indexing function and check whether the block exists there. If the block doesn't exist, you change your indexing function and query the cache again in some other location. Now you're actually querying the cache multiple times for a given block, but different locations by changing the indexing function to the cache. This is another way of thinking about associativity. Now you're actually find, providing associativity across time by using different indexing functions into the cache. Cheaper, of course, but longer latency. Associativity in space gives you shorter latency, but associativity in time gives you longer latency. But it can actually eliminate or reduce the conflict misses clearly by uh, making your cache more associative. I would recommend thinking about this a little bit. So there are other ideas like victim cache, better, or randomizing the indexing function so that you don't get conflicts or these hot sets or set crashing phenomenon as much. Provide software hints like we discussed earlier. So conflict misses can be reduced in different ways. Uh, so there's one question. What would be an example of a conflict miss? Basically, uh, what we had discussed earlier, right? If you have uh, ABC, uh, accesses uh, to uh, cache blocks A, B, C, A, B, C, A, B, C, A, B, C, and you can house only two of them, uh, C is a conflict miss or any, anything that misses a conflict miss in that case. And you have additional capacity in the cache. So you can refer to the last lecture where we talked about conflict misses. Okay, so capacity misses, how do you reduce this? Well, increasing the cache size other than increasing your cache size, of course. Utilizing cache space better is important here. Keep the blocks that will be referenced inside the cache. Uh, or do soft, better software management. Divide your working set and computation such that each computation phase uh, fits in the cache. The data that's required is in the cache in a given computation phase. And this is a great idea. And we're going to see some examples of the software management ideas as well. OK, so how to improve cache performance has fascinated many, many people. As I said, it led to many, many works, many, many patents, many, many papers, many, many improvements in existing hardware software and hardware software cooperative systems. And uh, there are three fundamental goals in it. Reducing the miss rate, reducing the missed latency or missed cost, and reducing the hit latency or hit cost. Clearly, these are parts of the equation, performance equation. So reducing the miss rate, there's a caveat. Reducing the miss rate can reduce performance if more costly to refresh blocks are evicted. So that's why reducing miss latency and miss cost is important. I mean, ideally, you would like to reduce hit latency or hit cost as well. And we're not going to talk about everything over here. Uh, but the above three, all of these three together affect performance. And it's, it's not an easy uh, performance equation in the end. 
So let's take a look at improving basic cash performance with these improved algorithms a little bit. So I'm not going to talk about everything. Some of these things we already talked about, actually. We're going to look at reducing miss rate and reducing miss latency and cost. And we're going to first look at some software approaches quickly. And then we're going to talk about some better replacement and insertion policies uh, uh, after that. So let's take a look at software approaches. So clearly, caches are invisible to software. But they could also, uh, software can actually take advantage of them by trying to maximize the hit rate by shaping the access patterns and shaping the data layout and shaping the computation so that the data that you're accessing is likely to hit in the cache. And that's the idea for software approaches. And there could be other software approaches that provide hints, as I said, using instructions. And that's another software approach, which we're not going to cover here. But instructions can provide hints saying that the data that I'm going to access is likely to be reused. So we're going to look at some software approaches like loop interchange, data structure separation and merging, and blocking or tiling. Uh, and the general idea in restructuring the data access patterns is to restructure the data layout or data access patterns so that you maximize your cache hit rate. And we've already talked about column major versus row order, row major uh, layout of matrices or vectors, for example, right? If you're doing column major ordering uh, um, layout of data uh, in a vector that looks like this, uh, X vector, for example, Xi plus one comma J follows Xi comma J in memory, basically. OK, these are actually the same. Uh, the next column is in the next memory location, right? Whereas the next row is far away uh, from the previous row. OK, so if you know that the data structure is laid out in a column major manner, what, you, what I'm showing you over here is poor code, basically. What this code is doing is really exercising the cache uh, misses, because it's really jumping to, uh, 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 in each iteration, it's, it's uh, the next access from X, access X i comma j is to i comma j plus one and then j plus two j plus three j plus four. So it's basically always accessing uh, something far away uh, in memory. As a result, it's not exploiting spatial locality well. So, but a simple change to this code by reordering the loops or interchanging the loops. This is called the loop interchange enables you to exploit the column major data layout in a much better way. So if you look at this, uh, what you're doing is in each in the in the inner loop, the access pattern looks like you access x i comma j. Uh, and then you, uh, in the next iteration, you access i plus 1 comma j. In the next iteration, i plus 2 comma j, i plus 3 comma j, dot, dot, dot. So basically, you're actually uh, exercising spatial locality really well based on the data layout of this vector over here. And this is the idea of loop interchange. So this can be done by the programmer. This can be done by the compiler. Uh, clearly, another way of doing this is basically changing the uh, layout of the vector. You can keep the same code, but change the layout of the vector such that x i, um, i comma j plus 1 uh, follows x i comma j uh, in mem memory layout. That's another way of doing it, by changing the data layout or structuring the access pattern. But uh, essentially, what I showed you over here to get to better code is loop interchange. Okay. Other optimizations can all increase hit rate. For example, you can fuse different loops accessing the same data structure. You can fuse different arrays that are being accessed in a similar pattern. I'm not going to talk about these in detail, but these are optimizations that are done by compilers and good programmers usually, so that you can maximize the spatial locality as well as the temporal locality of the code. Okay. For example, you can have two loops. One loop is going through one array. Array is huge, larger than your cache. Another loop is going through the same array again uh, and doing something else. If you can merge those loops and do two operations at once and go through the array only one time, then you get better locality in your caches, clearly. OK, blocking uh, is another uh, uh, um, optimization. This is also called tiling. Here, the idea is to divide loops operating on arrays or vectors or matrices into computation chunks so that each chunk can hold its data in the cache. Basically, if you're operating on a large matrix uh, that doesn't fit in your cache, let's say, well, sub uh, 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 partition the matrix into submatrices and operate on submatrices such that you get good locality. And then you move to the next submatrix in the computation. That's the idea over here. This avoids cache conflicts between different chunks of computation, essentially. And essentially, the idea is to divide the working set so that each piece that you're currently operating on fits in the cache. And this is a very general idea, blocking or tiling. It's also called tiling. I'll give you a very quick examples, and I'll refer you to some past lectures 
to see more examples. But this is an example that we had uh, provided in an earlier lecture on GPU computing. And same memory locations are accessed by laboring threads. So assuming that you're doing a filtering, you're applying this three by three filter on a huge image. This looks like a small image, yes, but assume that it's a huge image. Uh, does it make sense to apply the filter to, uh, in a streaming manner to the entire row and then go to the next row and then go to the next row, for example? And it may not make sense. Maybe you want to partition the image into smaller tiles, basically divide the input tiles uh, such that they can be loaded into the shared memory or scratch pad memory in GPUs, for example, at a given time. So that maybe your entire image doesn't fit into your scratch pad memory, but a piece of the image fits into the scratch pad memory. And the filter is applied to the piece of the image first. And then you exploit the locality in that piece of the image a lot. And then you move to the next piece of the image. And that's the idea of blocking and tiling. I'm not going to go through the details. And you can read uh, more code. A lot of code is written this way. Compilers do a lot of tiling in today's systems. Uh, and as a result, uh, you get significant uh, performance benefits. So somebody asked, what about the overhead for tiling? Certainly. I mean, whenever you divide code, just like we discussed in loop unrolling in an earlier lecture, for example, there are some overheads that you need to uh, 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 overcome. But certainly, there's overhead in all of these optimizations. And, but usually, if you do a, do a good job, uh, the benefit you get from keeping uh, exploiting the temporal and spatial locality in your caches overcomes that overhead. So there's nothing free. Uh, hopefully, uh, you have seen in this lecture that everything you do is a trade-off. And uh, the key question is, how do you actually uh, make the trade-off uh, a positive trade-off so that you overcome the overheads? But that's a very good question. You always need to keep into, in mind the overhead of the optimization that you do as well. OK. So uh, matrix multiplication is another example. I'm going to go through this relatively quickly. We've seen matrix multiplication earlier. Uh, for example, let's say you're multiplying matrix A and matrix B and storing the result into the C. For this to work nicely with caches, A, B, and C should fit in your cache or scratch pad memory in a GPU, for example, right? Now, what if they don't fit? What if A is 1 megabyte, B is 1 megabyte, and C is 1 megabyte, and your scratch pad is only 32 kilobytes, let's say? Well, what do you do? You chunk the computation. You basically divide the input matrices into sub-matrices, let's say. Uh, well, naive implementation basically may have poor cache locality based on what I described earlier. And you can read the code on your own if you're interested. But uh, the basic idea is if these don't fit into your cache, you uh, chunk uh, the matrices uh, into sub-matrices. And another reason why naive implementation doesn't have good locality is because Consecutive accesses uh, to B are far from each other because you, you're actually doing column accesses, whereas the matrices may be row major, right? Every access to B is likely to cause a cache miss in this case. And you can eliminate that or reduce that by actually uh, tiling uh, and dividing B into sub-matrices. So basically, you can achieve better cache locality by competing on smaller tiles or blocks that fit in the cache or in the scratch pad memory and the register file in a GPU, because register file is huge in a GPU, if you remember. So, and this is the basic idea. You operate on this tile and this tile in A, and then produce this tile in C. And then you maximize whatever you need to do on those tiles. And then you move to the next tiles. And then you move to the next tiles, next tiles, et cetera. Next tiles may be producing the same uh, results with C because this is matrix multiplication. For example, they may be updating similar locations over here. You can think about that. But tiled implementation operates on these sub-matrices, also called tiles or blocks, that fit fast memories. It could be the cache, it could be the scratch pad, it could be the register file. So the general idea is applicable to any fast memory. Okay, If your matrices don't fit your physical memory, you may, the general idea may be applicable to the physical memory as well. Okay, And you can see the code now multiplies small sub-matrices, tiles or blocks. Uh, and, and it's rewritten such that it's operating on tile dimensions as opposed to matrix dimensions. So if you go back to the previous code, the dimensions were really the matrix dimensions over here. But if your matrices don't fit or they don't have good access patterns, you can limit uh, them so that they fit into the cache or the access patterns uh, fit into uh, the cache as well. OK, so if you're really interested in this more, we have examples of tiled matrix multiplication on GPUs in an earlier lecture. And we may actually provide uh, an, uh, an optional lecture if you're really interested uh, that looks at GPU programming. OK, let's take a look at another example on restructuring data layout. And I'm going to give you this example on the left. Basically, you have a node that looks like this. It it's, uh, this is a linked list, essentially. 
uh, we're going to look at a pro insert based traversal of a linked list and assume we have a huge linked list, 1 billion nodes and unique keys. And we're going to traverse each node and check whether the input key by the user matches the key stored in the node. And if that's the case, we access other fields in the, of the node and do some operation that is not shown here. Otherwise, we move to the next node and do the same check in the next node. And the node looks like this, basically. You have a pointer to the next node. You have the key that you're searching for. And you have some other information, let's say a huge character array of name and school. Let's say you're searching for somebody uh, with a, uh, that matches a key, and then you're going to output the name and the school at that point. Now the question is, basically, you execute this code, and you find out that the code has terrible performance, terrible cache hit rate. And then the uh, question is, why? Well, I, can, I guess I've already given you the why over here. If you think about it a little bit, uh, what you're doing over here is uh, the node is huge. So whenever you're accessing, uh, usually what you're doing is basically you're doing a linked list traversal. And usually what you need in the node is the key and the next pointer, because the likelihood of the key to, uh, of matching the input key is very low. So you don't really need to store these huge elements inside the node array itself. Basically, other fields occupy most of the cache line, even though they're rarely accessed. Assuming that a node is allocated uh, consecutively in memory, what is happening over here is you have one byte, let's, let's say 32, um, well, let's say four bytes of a pointer, four bytes integer, eight bytes, OK? But now you have 256 bytes name, 256 bytes school. So this is much larger than a cache block, as you can see. So this spans multiple cache blocks. So the locality that you really need, which is the locality of accessing different nodes key, uh, keys and different nodes next pointers, cannot be exploited in the cache because you have structured your data not so nicely. So how do you fix it? Well, you basically have a separate data structure that uh, is allocated. And these are the less frequently used fields. So basically, separate your data structures such that you have multiple different data structures. Frequently used fields of a data structure are packed into a separate data structure. Or non-frequently used fields are packed into a separate data structure. That's what's happening over here. And we have a pointer from the data structure to the non-frequently used fields. So now this fits into a cache line, and you can pack many, many nodes into a single cache line. As a result, whenever you do node key and node next, the probability of getting a cache hit is higher because you didn't populate your cache with stuff that you're not going to access in the common case. Right? That's the idea over here. So this structuring can be done by the programmer, of course. Right? If you know what you're doing, then this is probably not a good code to write uh, for a good cache hit rate. Compiler can do it, potentially. Compiler can try to figure out what's frequently accessed, what is not frequently accessed. That, that can certainly partition the accesses. But of course, this may not be as easy to do, uh, but potentially doable. Hardware can potentially do it, but it's a difficult thing to do. Hardware can potentially figure out which fields are accessed frequently and pack those fields inside a cache block. But that requires changing the cache structures that we discussed earlier, and people have proposed such caches. Potentially, it can be done, but it requires a lot more hardware to actually do something like this. And of course, there's always the question, who can determine what's going to be frequently used, right? And what is the overhead for that, of course? And I will let, uh, I will, uh, let you think about it, because clearly, this is an idea that um, uh, can be done at many different levels, but some levels. If the programmer can do it, of course, this is much better, right? If a programmer, programmer uh, probably in this particular case is a good idea, right? But it's harder for the compiler and even harder for the hardware to figure that out. That's why programmer being conscious of the caches and underlying memory hierarchy is very important. OK, so we've talked about some software approaches. Now let's talk about some better replacement and insertion policies. And I'm going to focus on one thing that is often ignored, which is the missed latency and cost. And we've talked about this briefly early on, but let me ask you the question. What is the missed latency or missed cost affected by from a given level of cache hierarchy? It actually depends on two things. One is where does the miss get serviced from? And how much does the miss stall the process? And actually, the first one is related to the second one. But the second one is, second one is inclusive of the first one, but not, uh, uh, the first one is not the only thing that influences the second one, as we will see. So where does the miss get serviced from? It could be serviced from the local memory or the remote memory, different level in the cache hierarchy. It could lead to a row hit or a row conflict. Remember those? 
It could lead to queuing delays in the memory control and the interconnect or not. So basically, uh, the, uh, where does the misget service from affects the latency significantly and or by orders of magnitude actually. So a missed latency is important and this is part of the cost. How much does the miss stall the processor is actually the real question, final question in the end, because missed latency may be high, but is it overlapped with other latencies? Is, is the processor actually going to stall a lot? Is the data immediately needed by the processor? Is the incoming block going to walk, evict a longer to refresh block? So these are all things that affect missed cost or stalling of the processor. And some of them affect stalling of the processor in the long run potentially, which you may not easily anticipate, okay? So that's why missed latency and cost is actually important when you're optimizing a memory hierarchy. And one of the things that I will introduce over here uh, that we mentioned, but we never named it, but basically uh, servicing multiple misses in parallel or uh, 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 consecutively, starting them consecutively such that their latencies are overlapped is the no is, it's called the notion of memory level parallelism. It basically means generating and servicing multiple memory access in parallel. So this is an isolated miss. It costs a lot basically from the perspective of the processor. B and C are not isolated misses, they're parallel misses, meaning they overlap their latency. So if you'd want to decide what to cache in a cache, which one is more valuable? I would argue that A is more valuable to cache because if you cache A, you eliminate a stall by the processor. If you decide to cache either B or C, you don't eliminate the stall because if you cache B, let's assume you have only one thing to cache. If you cache B, C still remains and the processor stalls. If you cache C, B still remains and the processor stalls. But if you cache A, you eliminate the stall. That's why an isolated miss is more costly from the perspective of the processor compared to parallelness. That's why it makes sense for caching decisions to take this into account. So why does this happen? You've seen out of order execution, for example. Out of order execution leads to generation of parallel misses, for example. In vector processors, a large vector can lead to parallel misses. But a scalar reference can lead to an isolated miss, for example, right? And memory level parallelism varies. Some misses are isolated and some misses are parallel in systems. And how does this affect cache replacement? I'm going to give you an example, which is very interesting, which also shows that optimal in terms of minimizing the miss rate is not optimal in terms of minimizing the execution time. So basically, uh, if you want to uh, uh, get the same effect on performance, here you need to eliminate B and C together or eliminate A. Okay. Okay. So basically, traditional cache replacement policies try to reduce miscount. And the implicit assumption is that reducing miscounts reduces memory related stall time of the processor. But that's not always the case because misses with varying cost and memory level parallelism breaks this assumption. Eliminating an isolated miss helps performance more than eliminating a parallel miss that I showed you earlier. And eliminating a higher latency miss could help performance more than eliminating a lower latency miss, as to, given that both of them are equal, both of them are isolated, for example. Right. Okay, let me give you a very quick example. Uh, I'm going, going to run through this relatively quickly and refer you to some lectures, essentially. But let's assume that misses to blocks P1 through P4 can be parallel. Misses to blocks S1, S2, and S3 are isolated, just because you don't have memory level parallels. We're going to look at the performance of two replacement algorithms. One is minimizing the miscount. This is Beldi's optimal algorithm. And the other is reduces isolated misses, called MLP aware, let's say. And we're going to look at a fully associative cache containing only four blocks. This is a toy example again. You can house only four blocks in a cache. Now let's take a look. Basically, uh, let's assume that in the steady state, this is a loop. You're accessing P4, P3, P2, P1, and then P1, P2, P3, P4, and then S1, S2, S3, and you keep doing this repeatedly in a circular reference pattern. So let's take a look at Beldi's optimal replacement, and we're going to look at the hit-miss pattern of different cache block accesses. Beldi's optimal replacement in a steady state, if you actually decide what to cache, you will, this, you will, you will basically keep in cache P1, P2, P3, P4, because those are the ones uh, uh, that are going to be in the cache. But basically, all these optimal replacements, what it does is basically, it's going to keep in the cache uh, the, uh, uh, essentially the uh, blocks that are going to be used earliest in the future, right? It's going to evict the block that's going to be referenced farthest into the future, right? Okay, so here we have P4, P2, P2 P2, P1 in the cache. Now we have a decision. S1 comes, which one to replace? Well, we replace P1 because P1 is going to be the reference furthest into the future, right? Over here. S2, uh, P2, P3, P4 are referenced earlier, okay? But you get a miss on S1. Okay, now the cache looks like this. P4, P3, P2, S1. 
what is the thing that we're going to replace when we see S2? We're going to replace S1, right? Because P2, P3, P4 are going to be referenced uh, earlier than S1, as you can see in the cyclic reference pattern, OK? And then the same situation arises over here. You see S3. Which one are you going to replace? You replace S2, because P4, P2, P3 are going to be referenced earliest into the future. S3, S2 is going to be referenced after them. So you get three misses on these serial things. And then uh, you replace that. And then you go over here. Here, you can simulate it on your own if you like, but P4 gets a hit, P3 gets a hit, P3 get, P2 gets a hit, P1 gets a miss because you replaced it earlier. And as a result, if you actually simulate it, you get one stall over here, no stalls over here. This is somehow misaligned, sorry. Basically, you get one, two, three, four misses, and each of, for each of them, the processor stalls. So four misses, four processor stalls, assuming misses are equal time in this case. Maybe not bad, you can say. OK, what if you are smarter? Basically, what if you recognize that S1, S2, and S3 are more costly in terms of performance? And if you eliminate S1, you eliminate a stall. And if you did that, what you would do is keep S1, and S2, and S3 always in the cache and just replace P1, P2, P3, P4, and one location is used for those. So you get three misses here. Uh, for, the, for this access pattern, P2 or P3, P2, P1, you get three misses because P4 is in the cache, but P3, P2, P1 are not in the cache. And you don't touch S1, S2, S3 because they're important. They're costly. And at the end, when you come over here, you get, again, three misses. P1 hits, but the other three misses. OK, and then you iterate in the loop again, and same thing happens. Basically, in the steady state here, you get six misses, but two stalls because these misses are overlapped. Basically, you kept the costly isolated misses inside the cache. That's why you get, you get fewer stalls. Uh, yes, you get fewer stalls because the, these, these different misses, these three misses are serviced in parallel. These three misses are also serviced in parallel, even though you get higher miss rate, higher miss count compared to the optimal policy that minimizes the miss rate, you get lower stalls. And I think this is very telling. And hopefully this uh, shows you the importance of looking at full system performance as opposed to just miss rate. It's not just about the miss rate. Miss rate is trying to optimize something, miss rate, but miss rate is not always fully correlated with performance. And this example proves that point, basically. If your misses have different costs, it makes sense to keep the important misses blocks in your cache. As a result, even though you may increase your miss rate, you actually reduce your execution time in this particular loop, for example. OK, so that's the idea proposed in this paper. And you can take a look at this paper for more detail on how to exactly do it. I'm not going to tell you how to exactly do this. How do you incorporate this MLP into replacement decisions? This paper also finds out that sometimes you need to be cost aware. Sometimes you need to be LRU friendly. So it develops a hybrid cache replacement policy so that you get the best of both worlds. Because different access patterns have different types of requirements from the cache, as we discussed. And that's why I recommend this paper so that you can take a look. OK, uh, so with that, we're done with the improving basic cache performance at this point. And uh, uh, if you are really interested, in, so basically, we've covered the blue parts over here, at least at some level of detail. We didn't go into a lot of detail in some cases, for example, better cache replacement and insertion policies. There's a lot more to talk about over here. We didn't talk about victim caches. I talked about pseudo associativity. That's the associativity in time, actually that we discussed, not in space. We believe we talk about hashing, for example, different, using different indexing functions so that you minimize the probability of conflicts, for example. That's a good idea that's been employed in existing processors. Uh, but I'm not going to talk about these in detail. There's a lot more to talk about in caching. Uh, we could have a semester long talking about caching, as I mentioned in the last lecture. But if you're interested, you can take a look at uh, other lectures that talk about, for example, victim caches, which is a cool idea. Uh, and other things like multiple access in parallel, and maybe more details on actually hybrid replacement policies. I'm not going to talk about them in detail over here. And there's a lecture, uh, there are more lectures on cache optimizations. OK, so what I'm going to talk next is going to be op uh, optional, uh, but I think I would like to cover it uh, in a short time because we actually covered it uh, a little bit. Uh, so if you, uh, uh, if you don't want to hang out, you can drop off. If you want to watch it on your own, you can watch it on your own. But this is not going to be material that we cover uh, in exam. But if pe for people who are interested, 
uh, to learn about this, I'm going to cover it because next time we're going to start with uh, 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 virtual memory. So uh, multi-core issues in caching. I think this is very interesting. As you know, all systems today are multi-core systems and caches are even more important than multi-core system. And I'm going to flash you the pictures that I showed you earlier. I mean, these are all multi-core systems, for example, and multi-core, multi multi-core, multi-threaded systems. For example, you have 120 to uh, 128 threads in this case, for example, accessing many caches, right? And uh, that's true for GPUs also, right? So basically cache efficiency becomes even more important in a multi-core system and a multi-threaded system. Why? Memory bandwidth is at premium. Cache space is a limited resource across, shared, uh, across many cores and threads. Right? Then the question becomes, how do you design the caches in a multi-core system? This becomes even more interesting in a multi-core system basically. And many more design decisions come into play. Do you make the caches shared across threads, shared across cores, or do you keep them private to threads or cores? This is similar to the, do you, do you make the caches shared between instructions and data, or do you keep them private to instructions and private to data? Very similar design decision, basically, except it happens to be across threads and cores. How do you maximize the performance of the entire system? And this takes into account the missed rates, of course, but the missed latencies and costs that I mentioned earlier as well. How do you provide quality of service to different threads in a shared cache? If you decide that the cache is going to be shared across threads, how do you guarantee some predictable performance to different threads? And this becomes important because some threads may be very latency sensitive, right? It may be actually responding to some user input. User wants quick decision from that thread. And if it misses in the cache many, many times because some other thread is interfering with that thread in the cache, too bad, right? Should cache management these algorithms be aware of threads? That's an important question. How should cache space be allocated to threads in a shared cache? Today, actually, people have finally uh, moved to uh, allocating a space uh, in a shared cache to different threads so that they can provide quality of service. Then the question becomes, how should the cache space be allocated? How much cache space be allocated to different threads so that they can satisfy their quality of service, predictability, responsiveness requirements? Many, many interesting questions. And then there's another interesting dimension. Since efficiency is so important, should we maybe start considering storing data in a compressed format in some of the caches so that we can actually make better use of the space that we have? Of course, there are downsides to it. Now, whenever you access the cache, you need to compress the data, right? Unless you're operating on compressed data in your processor core, which is not the case today, of course, right? And then how do we use, how do you do better use prediction and management in caches? Because this is much more important in a multi-core system because you have many, many more threads requiring service from the memory heart. Okay, so a private versus shared cache, as I said, this is very similar to instruction versus data. In a private cache, cache belongs to one core or one thread. In a shared cache, cache is shared by multiple cores. So this is the picture, if you will. This is a very simple picture, right? Uh, at the core granularity, these L2 caches are private. At the core granularity, this L2 cache is shared. So if the cache belongs to one core, a shared block may be in multiple caches, of course, right? So you have a redundancy problem. Whereas if the cache is shared across many cores, a single memory block occupies only one location, right? That's one advantage of a shared cache for you immediately. But it's a trade-off. Like everything, it's a trade-off. Resource sharing concept is actually a bigger concept. Uh, basically, instead of dedicating a hardware resource to a hardware context or a core or a thread, hardware context can be loosely thought of as a core or thread, allow multiple hardware contexts to use it. In this case, the, uh, the resource happens to be the L2 cache. In this case, uh, basically, dedicate, we're dedicating the L2 cache to one core. Whereas here, we're sharing the L2 cache across multiple cores, right? Example resource can be many, though. It could be functional units, pipeline, caches, buses, memory, SSDs, imagine anything in the system. So why do we want to do resource sharing? Because it improves utilization and efficiency. As a result, it leads to higher throughput. Why? Because when a resource is not used by one thread, another thread can use it, right? If they share the resource. If, they, if, it's, if the resource is partitioned, so that resource is private, even if this thread is not using it, using its private resource, another thread cannot use it because it's private to that thread, right? You've dedicated the resource to that thread. So by definition, Resource sharing provides better utilization and efficiency, which leads to higher throughput overall. And also there is no need to replicate the shared data, which also leads to higher throughput because if all threads are using the same data, let's say, then all of that data is replicated in different caches and you need to bring the data to different caches one by one. 
Whereas if you have a shared cache, you, don't, you didn't replicate the data inside that cache because it's a shared cache by definition. Right? OK, so resource sharing also reduces communication latency. For example, if you have data shared between multiple threads, that can be kept in the same cache in multi-threaded processors. Right? That's nice, of course. And finally, this is compatible with the shared memory programming model. Probably you're seeing the shared memory programming model in your uh, parallel programming course. And if you're sharing the memory, it makes sense to share the memory resources, physical resources as well. But of course, resource sharing also comes with disadvantages. It results in contention for resources. And we saw this, if you remember, in earlier lectures. In one of the mysteries, we talked about memory performance attacks, right? This happened because different threads, different applications shared the memory bus and the memory banks and the memory row buffer. As a result, the scheduler became a contended resource. And if the decisions made by the scheduler are not good enough, then you have significant unfairness in the system. So basically, contention for resources, uh, when, it, when the resource is not idle because one thread is utilizing it, another thread cannot use it. By definition, you don't have a private resource for yourself. So uh, you cannot uh, have guaranteed service in that resource, essentially. So if uh, this happens in time and space, in time when the resource is not idle, another thread cannot use it. If the space is occupied by one thread, another thread needs to reoccupy it. So essentially, one thread can evict the cache block of another thread, essentially. And this may happen, for example, if you have a shared 32 kilobyte cache and each thread needs 32 kilobyte on its own, too bad. You may be thrashing the cache. Right? So basically, disadvantage of resource sharing is it can sometimes reduce each thread's performance or some thread's performance or all thread's performance, actually. Thread performance can be worse than when it's run alone. So because when you're running alone on the same system, you have the cache to yourself. But when you're running, alone, running together with multiple threads, you, you don't have the cache to yourself. As a result, you may actually lose performance significantly because some other thread is evicting your cache blocks. Right? So this is a big problem with resource sharing in general. So you need to somehow control the resource sharing if you don't want to run into issues like this. And we talked about this in one of the mysteries lectures from the perspective of the memory controller. Similar ideas can be applied to caches. Uh, Actually, some of you mentioned at that time, uh, uh, caches may have the same problem. And absolutely, yes. OK, so if you share the resources, you are eliminating performance isolation because the resources are not private anymore. As a result, uh, the thread that's executing is not guaranteed some amount of cache, for example, or some amount of memory bandwidth. As a result, it's always getting, it's, it's the performance is always dependent on what else the other threads running in the system is doing to its blocks in the cache how much interference there is from the other threads. As a result, you may get inconsistent performance across different runs of the same program. And that's potentially a downside because you may, optimize, you may want to optimize your program for the cache hierarchy, right? If you cannot assume that your cache hierarchy is dedicated to you, then it's very hard to optimize the performance of your program because somebody else is interfering with you and that somebody else may be different every time. Performance isolation is important for performance optimization of the programs. That's why also knowing how much cache you may have in a system is important so that you can optimize the performance. Basically, thread performance depends on co-executing threads, and that makes performance isolation go away. And performance optimization becomes extremely difficult, if not impossible. And uncontrolled resource sharing, if you don't control the resource sharing, as we have seen in memory performance attacks, for example, this degrades quality of service. It degrades predictability in the system. And it, basically, you have an unpredictable and potentially vulnerable system to denial of service attacks as well, it's because you cause unfairness and starvation to some threats. So basically, resource sharing is good for throughput, but you need to be careful about not uh, causing these disadvantages as well. You need to efficiently and fairly utilize the shared resources in a system so that you don't run into these bad disadvantages that we have discussed earlier in memory performance attacks as well. So private versus shared cache is one example of this, basically. In a private cache, resource is not shared. In a shared cache, the resource is shared. And clearly, you have the same issues. So let's take a look at this particular example. If uh, We're looking at the advantages of shared caches between cores uh, over private caches between cores. And we're going to also look at the disadvantages. So clearly, if you have shared cache, you have high effective capacity. If one core is not using the 4 megabyte L2 cache, that's dedicated to it, another core can use that resource. Similar to the example that I gave you between instruction and data caches, right? You can dynamically allocate the resources. 
And this could be actually very good, right? Imagine four L2 caches, each of them four megabytes. So effective capacity is 16 megabytes. If you make them partitioned across four cores, each core gets four megabytes, that's great. But if one core needs eight megabytes, it basically thrashes its own cache. It cannot reuse the, it cannot use the cache space dedicated to other cores. But if you do the sharing uh, of the cache capacity, then you get high effective capacity. And this, this is very uh, similar. To, basically, this is enabled by dynamic partitioning of the available cache space. You don't get fragmentation issues due to static partitioning, which is essentially what I talked about. If one core does not utilize some space, another core can. And that sounds great. And also, it's easier to maintain coherence because a cache block is in a single location. The cache block is not replicated across different caches, which requires maintaining coherence. If the cache block is in a single location, that's it. You don't need to keep it coherent, at, at least at that level of the cache, right? Disadvantage, of course, there is disadvantages, right? And it's slower access because cache is not tightly coupled with the core. If you have a cache private to the core, you can tightly couple the cache to the core. In fact, you can integrate it to the design of the core also better, even if it's an L2 cache, for example. So you can make it faster access for that core. But now if you have a shared cache, you need to have some sort of interconnect connecting the cores and the cache. As a result, by nature, it has to be slower. And of course, as we talked, cores incur conflict misses due to other cores accesses. This are, these are misses due to inter-core interference. And some cores can destroy the hit rate of other cores essentially this way. So imagine one core having good locality in its cache. Imagine another core streaming through terabytes of memory. And it's bringing all of that data into the cache and evicting uh, the core that has good locality in the cache. So that sounds like a bad thing and it should not happen. And of course, guaranteeing a minimum level of service or fairness to each thread uh, or each core is harder now. Uh, how much space do you allocate to each core? How much bandwidth do you allocate? How do you design a partitionable cache? And these are all good questions to ask. And clearly these questions arise in real system designs, real multi-core system designs because real multi-core system designs have both private caches as well as shared caches. And we've seen examples of this. I'm going to show you maybe more examples. Uh, I don't remember if they were in these slides, but maybe in the beginning of the next lecture, I will show you. Uh, but certainly private caches, L1 caches are private to the core, but they may be shared across multiple threads within the same core because each core actually does either fine-grained multi-threading or simultaneous multi-threading, which we have discussed earlier. Yeah, multiple threads, uh, hard hardware context inside a core. L1 caches are usually private to the core, but shared between multiple threads that are multiple hardware contexts within the core. L2 caches may or may not be private to the core. L3 caches are usually shared across cores and maybe many, many cores in the system. So these issues arise in existing systems and existing systems actually have to make choices. Uh, so this is an issue that happens in multi-core systems uh, that uh, is very, very important to handle. It affects your performance a lot actually. So if you're interested in this, clearly there's a lot more to talk about. We didn't even talk about mechanisms to get the benefits of both shared and private at the same time, for example. But uh, if you're interested, you can take lectures. Uh, you can either uh, take the advanced course or you can watch some lectures online that we put up. And there are also software-based management mechanisms. Page coloring, for example, that's depicted in this slide is a software-based cache partitioning mechanism. And the software can allocate pages to different indices in the cache such that different applications do not uh, conflict with each other in the cache. And this is a beautiful idea that, that is employed in some operating systems and it can actually enable you to uh, manage your cache better at the software level. But of course it has its downsides as well because at the software level, you don't have a lot of control on your cache. So you may actually, uh, whenever you need to reconfigure the partitions of your cache, you may actually incur a lot of performance loss in this case. But these are very, very interesting ideas. There are software ideas, there are hardware ideas. There are software hardware cooperative ideas to manage the caches and the cache hierarchy in the multi-core systems as well. And there, there's a lot more to be done in this area. And of course, there are approaches to reuse prediction that may better manage the caches using better compressed cache hierarchies are an example of also a better efficient and more efficiently utilizing the cache hierarchy. And there's a lot more ideas here that I'm not gonna cover, but I'm gonna refer you to these lectures over here. And also there are a lot of ideas on memory resource management as well, uh, which we didn't have a lot of time to talk about, but we mentioned, for example, memory performance attacks. And there are a lot of interesting questions over here, like how do we reduce the inter-thread interference? How do we control it? And how do we make the memory system more configurable, flexible, such that it can cater to different needs and different access patterns of different applications uh, 
And again, there's a lot more to talk about over here, uh, but we don't have time in this particular lecture. Okay, uh, maybe I will, uh, again, all of this is optional. I will quickly cover cache coherence as well, and then we'll be done because I'm not going to actually talk more about it, but probably you've seen cache coherence in your parallel programming lectures if you're still uh, hanging out in the lecture. Uh, but the basic idea of cache coherence is if you have multiple processors, and if multiple processors cache the same block, how do they ensure they all see a consistent state? That's the basic idea over here. And you've probably seen it in your parallel programming lectures. That's why we're not going to spend a lot of time. But you may not have seen how it's implemented in hardware, for example. And that's we're not going to cover also in this lecture. For that, you need to take an advanced course. But basically, the problem looks like this. You have two processors in this particular case, and you have two caches. And you have one memory location, x, that stores 1,000. Let's say processor 2 loads into R2, 1,000. Uh, this location x, uh, and that load gets loaded into the cache. And then processor one later loads also uh, into one of its registers, uh, location x. That gets loaded into processor one's cache. Now, both of the processor have these two, uh, the, the same location redundantly stored in their caches because these are private caches. They're not shared caches. Now you see the benefit of a shared cache. Shared cache doesn't have this problem, right? And then let's say processor one does something increments or in increases the value by to 2,000 and stores the result into its cache. Now the values are inconsistent. The value of x is seen by processor 1 as 2,000. It's seen by processor 2 as 1,000. So whenever processor 1 modifies the location, processor 2 should not load 1,000 from its cache because somebody else updated that location in between. And this is really required so that you can guarantee consistency in a system, which is a broader topic uh, that I will refer you to later on. But if processor 2 loads 1,000, uh, in this case, your synchronization primitives may not be correctly implemented in hardware. As a result, you may not be able to synchronize between these processors correctly. And that's why you need to keep the caches coherent with each other. Whenever processor 1 updates this value, maybe that update gets propagated over here. Or maybe you invalidate the same location X from all of the other caches. There are multiple approaches to coherence, which I'm not going to talk about right now. But uh, you can certainly uh, approach the problem as updating also other, loca other processors, locations, other caches that cache the same data. So whenever you update this cache, you update all of the other caches as well. This is called an update-based protocol. Or whenever you update this cache, you may decide to invalidate all of the other locations. And of course, there's a question, what happens to main memory as well, right? Do you update the main memory as well? But I'm not going to talk about those in detail. I'm going to give you one example of cache coherence protocol, and then we're going to end with pointers to other lectures. Essentially, this is a very simple coherence scheme. This is an invalidation-based coherence scheme. All caches, snoop, observe each other's read and write operations, all operations. All operations uh, done by each processor is exposed to all of the caches. Assume that this is implementable. This could be implemented in a bus-based system. Basically, everybody is connected to the same bus, same single wire, let's say. And snooping is basically looking at what's on the wire. And whenever a processor writes a block or reads a block, they basically broadcast it to everyone. And if a processor writes to a block, all other caches that have the same block in their cache invalidate the block. That's the idea of this protocol. And this is a very simple two-state protocol. A cache block can be invalid and invalid state. And uh, let's, let's assume that it's in the valid state. When you observe a write on the bus, uh, the cache, uh, each cache basically snoops uh, the bus or the, uh, looks at, observes what other processors are doing. Whenever you observe that somebody else is writing to this particular block, you invalidate the block. That's the idea. And that's basically what this says. I'm not going to go into the details of this, but there are some assumptions for why and when and under what conditions this protocol works. For example, the caches need to be right through because of the way signals are defined over here. Uh, it has to be no right allocate because of the way, again, signals are defined over here. And the local processor can do a read or write to the block. As you can see, local processor is potentially doing read or write to the block. And uh, whenever some other processor does a read or write to the block, that gets broadcast on the bus so that every other processor can execute the state machine for that given block. OK? If the block is valid in the cache, and if there's a bus write, to a block, meaning that some other processor is writing to that block, each cache independently transitions to the invalid state. They invalidate the block. Okay, 
So this is a very simple protocol. Existing systems do not use it because it has a lot of disadvantages, but we're not going to go into it. Existing systems actually use more states. Uh, and if you're really interested in this, this is one example of a MESI protocol, for example, which was developed in the 1980s, which a variant of which is used in many existing processors today. But again, I'm not going to go into the details of it. You may have seen examples of it in the parallel programming course, but how it's implemented, why it works, what are the design decisions that can make it better? That is the subject of a future course. And if you're interested, you can certainly watch the lecture early on as well, because now you have the basics to watch the lecture. And there's also an important uh, uh, distinction between coherence and consistency. Memory ordering becomes an important problem for synchronization as well. And we cover those issues in advanced lectures. I just wanted to uh, give you the name consistency or memory ordering. How do you do the memory ordering across uh, different blocks? And how does the processor observe the memory ordering across different blocks becomes important, extremely important for correct synchronization across processors. And you need to provide some primitives inside the hardware so that the programmer can synchronize different processes correctly that are executing on different uh, cores or different multiprocessors. But uh, sequential consistency is one example. And this slide, this particular slide is describing sequential consistency, for example. But again, you don't need to know about any of this, all of this part of the lecture that talks about multi-core issues in caching was optional, as I said. Uh, but if you're interested, uh, there's a lot of interesting stuff to learn about over here. And these are also very interesting research topics going into the future in terms of that span both hardware and the software. And uh, thinking about, critically thinking about existing approaches and how to make them better can enable much more scalable systems into the future. So these are the list of lectures on cache coherence and consistency. And this is the place that I'm going to stop uh, I think in the next lecture, uh, we will pick up with prefetching. I think this is an important concept uh, that I would like everybody to learn about. And then we're going to move into virtual memory. So unless uh, I see there are still some people following, that's great. Uh, but again, if you were not following the last 25 minutes or so, they were all optional. Uh, but if you have any burning questions, I'm happy to take them. Otherwise, uh, this is probably a good place to uh, hang up and uh, wish you a great weekend. Okay, I don't see any questions. Uh, so have a great weekend. Uh, I will see you next Thursday when we will talk about prefetching and virtual memory. Take care and stay safe and hopefully get vaccinated because that's happening. And hopefully with everyone vaccinated, we'll have uh, a healthy next semester that's going to be much better than this semester. Okay, take care.